All right, well, thank you for joining us for the um, Mayor's Monarch Pledge. It's very exciting. Columbia Heights is taking this on. Um, our last mayor, Donna Schmidt, had started this a few years ago, um, did a few things, but we're gonna kind of revisit it and bring it back for Columbia Heights. Oh, okay. Um, so yes, um, today's meeting is actually gonna go until possibly until 2.30. One of the emails I sent out had said till two. And just wanted to let you know, I'm, I think it might take an hour and a half with some question and answer at the end. <clears throat> of course, if you need to leave at all, of course, you're welcome to um, leave early. We will send an email follow-up at the end of the email. So, or the end of the meeting. So if you need to leave early, that's just fine. But thank you so much for joining the cause to improve habitat for monarchs and pollinators. Um, on the call today is my husband Frost and I'm gonna let him go through, um, I'm sorry, first of all, this is just the agenda for today. So we'll go through some Zoom reminders, introductions for who's in the room, um, what is the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, if you hadn't had a chance to look into it, what are we currently doing in the city and um, community groups that are already working on things, what else can we do to go through the pledge, then we'll go through question and answers at the end and um, our next steps to move forward. So I just wanna rem remind you of these wonderful words by Dr. Seuss, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. So thank you so much for being here. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Frost Simulan. He's gonna go through this part of our agenda. Everybody, if you haven't been on a Zoom call with this many people before, it can get kind of overwhelming. So we'd like to ask everybody to stay on mute as best you can. And uh, what works best here is if you are in presenter, excuse me, in speaker view. So if you click on the upper left hand corner um, and change from gallery view to speaker view, that works best for this type of presentation. If you have any questions, put them in the chat. Um, you'll notice the chat bubble, bubble at the bottom. And I will be, um, what you wanna do is just say question for the mayor or question for Amada. I will be recording those questions uh, separately and kind of curating them. And we'll get to those at the very end. Um, if that chat bubble and those little uh, red notifications uh, keep bothering you, you can just click on that and it will open a separate window that you can then drag off to the side of the screen and then you don't have to look at it anymore. <laughs> Um, so why don't we just, everybody stay on mute until the end, and then uh, when we call your name for questions, we can get to you then. Thanks. Thank you, Frost. Um, another thing I thought would be great, if you could introduce yourself in the chat, you can put your name, and um, if there's a certain thing you're excited about, are you excited specifically about Monarchs? Is it about um, just the environment? Is it planting, native plantings? Um, if there's anything specific that you're really interested in right now, before we even start the meeting, uh, put your name in there and what you're super excited about or your exp expertise. Uh, we will keep track of the chat afterwards. And so that'll help if there's any notes like that. So feel free to enter as many things as you want in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Frost. Um, so today on the call, we will have uh, myself here. My name again is Amada Marcus Simola. Um, Council member Connie Bisgins is also joining us. Uh, our city manager, Kelly Bourgeois, is on the call. She'll be taking notes as well. And then um, the chat facilitator is uh, my husband, Frost. We have some special guests that are joining us um, who, for the most part, live in Columbia Heights. And they will just uh, say hi. So I'll just ask them just in the chat to make sure they say hi. Um, Sarah Evenson is a landscape architect and has volunteered to help with um, helping to teach people about gardening. Lisa Much Reggae is a master gardener with Anoka County. Um, you can wave for sure if you're on the call too. Uh, Faye Post is an experienced monarch parent. She's raised thousands of, of monarchs, she said. Um, Ali Monahan is an entomologist and insect scientist here in Columbia Heights. And Scott Van Cleve is a uh, survey designer data specialist with the Science Museum of Minnesota. So these are some people who initially reached out to me and just said, I'm really interested um, what can I do to help? So I just know these names. We also have Tammy Schmidt on the call. She is very experienced with native plantings. And so I just wanna let you know, if you know nothing about gardening or monarchs, we have a lot of people here. 
way smarter than me that are gonna help us and help our city really help our monarchs and our pollinators. So I'll just read through a very a summary of what the mayor's monarch pledge in case you haven't had a chance to look into it. Um, and you can read along with me, obviously. The monarch butterfly is an iconic North American species whose multi-generational migration and metamorphosis from caterpillar to butterfly has captured the imagination of millions of Americans. And I'll say North Americans, including Canada and Mexico. Mayors and heads of local or tribal government are deeply concerned about the decline of the monarch butterfly population. Both the Western and Eastern monarch populations have experienced a significant decline. We recognize the importance of creating monarch and pollinator habitats at parks, gardens, and other green spaces. Every member of our community can equally enjoy those. Our work is to help save the monarch butterfly intentionally engages all parts of our communities, ensuring that historically marginalized Communities are not left out of the work or the many benefits this work will create. When mayors speak up and take a stand, our communities notice. Therefore, we hereby commit to help restore habitat for the monarch and encourage our residents to do the same so that these magnificent butterflies will once again flourish across the continent. So to do the mayor's monarch pledge, we must do at least three action items this year. The first one you have to do is have a proclamation. I guarantee we're going to do that. You host a, one of the things you can do is host a native plant and seed exchange. I can guarantee that's going to happen. And I can guarantee that we will be increasing native plants in our city. So therefore we have successfully taken on the pledge. And by the end of the year, we will have done at least three items. No problemo, but we're going to do even more. So first, we're gonna talk about and learn what the city of Columbia Heights is doing to help the monarch butterfly and pollinators. And we're going to listen to Connie Bisgins, our council member. Um, she's gonna go through some of these topics. And then if you have questions for her, put them in the chat and then we'll go through those at the end. So Connie, I'll let you unmute and uh, come on in and talk to us about what we're doing in the city. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to see everybody here. This is um, a wonderful thing that we'll be working on and uh, I'm very excited. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go over several things that have been, a, that we've already been working on. Uh, first off with uh, city parks, um, we have a wonderful public works department and there's several people that have already been working on our parks to add native plants for our pollinators in our community. Um, if you haven't been to these parks, I invite you to go check them out. Um, Prestaman around the holding pond has, uh, has native plants in there, lots of milkweed for our monarchs. LaBelle, for those of you who have been here a long time, um, I don't know if you were here 20 years ago when they had, uh, they had this old structure that was falling apart. We finally received monies, I believe it was from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization that gave us grant money. They got rid of the falling structure and restored the native uh, shoreline, added um, pollinator native plant gardens. They also have a holding pond that is a rain garden that has native plants in there. Um, the other um, LaBelle and Prestaman and then Hewsett around the holding pond. We also have native plants there. Um, and just before I forget, the two people that have been working really hard on this is John Nordland, who is our master gardener that's employed by our city, and Liam Genter, who is our forester. Both those individuals have played a large part in helping continue um, adding pollinator plants and uh, native plants to our city. Um, in addition, just recently, Liam Genter has been working on um, native plants and flowers around um, Jackson Pond. And I don't know if you guys noticed last summer, if you drove down uh, Stinson, um, where our new um, reservoir or holding pond is before the water goes into Silver Lake, was surrounded by beautiful native flowers for a while. And it's something that they can keep growing. They mow it down a couple of times during the summer and then it comes back and it was just gorgeous. And one of the exciting things that Liam's working on is a new experiment in our parks. He has planted several different types of pollinator friendly turf in our parks and different properties in the city. And he's waiting to the summer to see which ones 
take hold and work. And if we have a successful time, which I'm hoping we do, he will be open to giving classes to our residents and how they can um, set up their own pollinator uh, friendly lawns in our city. Um, the next thing is our city hall garden, which I started, it was there for many, many years. And when I first volunteered for the beautification committee in our city, um, there uh, was just petunias there. And every, I'd go water that every week and I'd check around and all I saw, you know, which is great, teeny weeny little bees were in the petunias, but I didn't see much else. So I asked uh, for permission to put in pollinator uh, friendly native uh, flowers in the garden and that were perm that were perennials and now it's come to life. We have lots of butterflies, lots of different types of bees that come there and it's worked out really well. The Blooming Sunshine Food Forest and Pollinator Gardens was set up by Heights Next um, two years ago and the year before that we worked to get permission from the city to take over a baseball field in Lomiaki Park. And first year we set up cover crops and got the soil um, going. And then last year we planted lots of uh, uh, orchard uh, fruit trees. We have a hazelnut bush in there. We planted quite a few annuals, tomatoes, peppers, and things like that. And what it is, is it's a food forest and I can read you a definition. Food forest gardening is a low maintenance, sustainable plant-based food production and agroforestry system based on woodland ecosystems incorporating fruit and nut trees, shrubs, herbs, vines, and perennial vegetables, which have yields directly useful to humans. And what we're doing is hopefully once this gets established and even with the annuals that we put in there too, um, we uh, welcome the community to come and pick uh, tomatoes, peppers. We have herbs in there already. Um, anything that they find that they need for, for their personal needs. And the hope is that this will become a great place to uh, one, set up uh, areas for the pollinators. We have a whole row every year we put in there the last two years, zinnias and some other flowers that we get quite a few monarchs already coming in there. Um, we also established on the berm by the railroad trap, by the railroad, um, not tracks, but any of the railroad area, um, we set up uh, pollinator and native uh, plants on the berm, which includes several different types of milkweed. And this year we've expanded that and I will go into that later what we're doing there. Uh, Lion's Garden, um, Tammy Schmitz is here. Hoping if Tammy could uh, give us a status on the Lion's Garden that we've been working on at the corner of Stinson and 37th. Sure. So the Lions Garden um, is actually right at the corner, like Connie said, of 37th and Stinson. It was a garden that was started by a gentleman from a St. Anthony Lions Club, but funded also by our Columbia Heights Lions. And it had gone into some disrepair due to illness on the part of the gentleman that started the garden. And uh, John Nordland that Connie mentioned earlier from the city reached out and the MWMO, the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization, kind of helped connect master water gardeners to help John uh, start revamping the garden and maintaining it, just trying to get out some weeds and very aggressive plants that were taking over that weren't native. And then Heights Next came on board uh, as a civic club and started assisting with some additional manpower hours or people power hours. And so now we are at a stage of, this will be I think our fourth year in the garden. And we've been able to remove a lot of uh, weeds and those in invasive aggressive plants with some help from uh, funding that the Lions have provided and prairie restoration going in and helping get rid of some kind of persistent icky weeds we just couldn't get a handle on. So we're at the stage where we just have a lot of mostly native plants that have been installed in that time period and we're now nurturing more than just about anything else. But we will be looking for some volunteers when we get to that part of the program to help us. It's a nice big garden so even if we have COVID it'll be a great spot for volunteers to help because we can socially distance and get a lot done. We're using that garden for outreach opportunities to the community. We could very easily seed share there uh, as well as some other fun activities. So I'll leave it at that so we keep on track for our program today. Thank you, Tammy. Okay, and moving on. Um, I don't know how many people are aware of, but we have two community garden plots. Um, one up on Reservoir by Crestview has quite a few plots, I think 40. And then there's another one that's across the street from where our old library is off of 40th. And both those areas also have um, 
uh, pollinator friendly plants. We have quite a few monarchs. I know the one that I use up on the hill, we see monarchs, people plant flowers in their gardens and mix it in with their vegetables and things like that. Um, I also about five years ago worked with uh, Faustina's Girl Scout uh, troop um, with uh, St. Matthew's Church. And uh, we set up, they were about five, six years old at the time, kindergartners, and uh, it was a cold, wet day. And we went up there and got their plants in and uh, the girls had a wonderful time setting it up. By the time when they first started, they were uh, quite shy. And by the time they were done, they were covered in mud and, and we had a wonderful time. They were so excited. And every year their, tr their group comes up and checks on their garden and adds more flowers. And uh, just a, a pointer there, if anyone wants a small project to work on to help with that garden, we need a, we didn't have many materials to create a border. So if anyone's good at creating borders, um, that's one, one project you can help with the Girl Scouts. Um, again, I already talked about Liam Nielsen, our city forester. He is phenomenal with the knowledge of trees that he has and the pollinator friendly trees and shrubs. Um, he's a great resource that our city has. Um, we also encourage milkweed plantings. Um, we're hoping uh, this summer to find a spot down by Lomiaki, either in a spot that's south of it or on the berms to add a ton of milkweed plantations. There's a guy named Dan O'Brien. He's our assistant fire chief and he grew up on that street. And when he was a kid, there was a section of that area in Lomiaki that was completely filled in with milkweed. And certain times of the summer, it would be covered with monarchs. And it would be wonderful if we could find a spot again in that area that we can create that same thing, because that would be awesome. We could put a bench there. Folks could come and relax and enjoy the monarchs. Um, we also have our host. Uh, we also at this time for, I think it's three or four years, Amada. At least now we've had uh, plant exchanges in the spring and in the fall. I think we're at five years, I think. Five years, yeah, and that's uh, hosted by Heights Next. We will continue with that. And uh, the other thing that I was going to mention, um, churches and schools. We have two churches, First Lutheran Church that has a, a community garden in their property, and I believe they have native plants and there are a few, at least garden flowers for the bees and the uh, monarchs butterflies. And Church of All Nations, I don't know how many of you have been driven down Benjamin Street by Silver Lake, it used to be an old school, and they set up a beautiful permaculture garden in their lawn, and it's a work in progress and a wonderful thing, so we have quite a few things, and our schools, up at the Highland and the high school, we have a wonderful school garden up there. And I believe the second garden the school has is in North Park. Is it North Park that has the other? Yep, yep, yep. So, yep. And uh, so those are also opportunities that folks can join later if they want to, to help out. And they have pollinator plants up there and working on native plantings at the schools. That's been an ongoing project with them around their landscaping. And uh, the last, most uh, new exciting thing that's happening that I'm super excited. I was looking at the Prairie Moon native plant catalog and saw two pages that said host plants. And it all of a sudden dawned on me. I knew of host, some host plants that different butterflies lay their eggs on. And a friend of mine has been educating me on that. But here was two pages full of the plants. So Heights Next is uh, we purchased uh, at least eight or nine different host plants and uh, Kat Adet Lubke, who is also the leader um, that helps set up, she's a horticulturist, has helped us set up this new garden, this Blooming Sunshine Garden Lomiaki. We are gonna set up Heights, Columbia Heights' very first nursery for butterflies. We already have the milk we, we set up in one portion of the pollinator garden. We just set up a new section that will be ready to plant on the berm. Um, the spring and we will have at least 10 different types of plants that we're planting to host 10 different types of butterflies. So it's super exciting. We'll have a sign there with the pollinator. You gotta come check it out. And uh, very, very excited about it. And then we're hoping in the future once COVID settles down that we can have classes and educate people about these plants so they in turn can put them in their yard. Um, and uh, super excited about that. And with that, I think, I am finished again. Thank you, everybody who is here joining us today to talk about monarchs and what we can do to help them and other pollinators. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. So as you can see, we are doing a lot. And I have to say, I think five years ago, our city was doing 
a couple things. It was a very new idea, you know, this native plantings to a lot of people, it was new. Not that it was new to everybody, but um, yes. So we wanted to really let everybody know that there is a lot happening in the city right now. Um, and maybe you weren't aware of it. So I wanted to bring that up, bring it to your attention. And, um, and now we're gonna go into um, some dreaming up some new ideas for the monarch butterflies. Uh, sorry, it's hard to. So some ideas that are suggested by the um, National Wildlife Federation is um, having a monarch butterfly festival. And a festival could mean we just have a picnic at the park and everyone does their own thing. And maybe you bring some signs that say that you love butter butterflies or monarch. So a festival doesn't have to mean three days of festival. <laughs> Um, but we could do a butterfly festival. We could do a movie night. Um, one of the ideas I think would be really great is um, I'm calling it Map Our Monarchs. We would go to uh, Google Maps. Everyone who does a, a garden in your own house would just put yourself on the map, you know, this special map that we would have. Um, and you would just say, yes, we do this. And you'd put in there how many square feet your garden is. And then we could figure out the percentage of Columbia Heights that is uh, pollinator friendly, you know, how much we're, we're taking our city to to house and habitat and feed the butterflies as they're traveling from uh, North America to Mexico. We can initiate citizen science efforts to monitor the monarch migration and health. These are things so we can capture data with, you know, uh, home school um, students, um, the schools could be doing this, looking into how they want to track it. These are all things that go towards counting um, how much we're participating in the Monarch Pledge. One of the other things is um, changing the ordinance in Columbia Heights so that all of the sides, the pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, that we use in our city aren't harmful. Um, so people could come together and petition or make sure they're contacting their um, council members um, with if they are in favor of this so that we are not harming the bees and the butterflies. Um, and as you know, we harm the bees and the butterflies, we're harming the owls, we're harming other birds that eat them, and it just goes, goes forward and forward. Um, creating a community art project will count towards the pledge. Creating community-driven education strategies, specifically that focus on benefiting underserved residents. So making sure we don't have any holes in our city, in our community, that, um, that isn't getting looked at. There aren't ways that we can help those areas to have more flowers. We don't wanna have it just in your own neighborhood. We wanna make sure we're, we're taking as many spots in the city as possible. Um, working with the school garden, Connie mentioned the Blooming Heights garden. The um, agriculture specialist, Wes is his name and he is on board 100% to um, work with the Monarch Pledge and would love a couple volunteers. So he has said, if he had you know, two to three volunteers from, from the community who wanted to help out at that garden kind of continually all summer, even if it's just an hour a week, um, would be better for him than 10 people once in a while that he has to retrain. So if you think you'd like to work um, in the school garden, uh, that's an opportunity. And we also can definitely have a tour there and have a class there. So he wants to open up his space to the community um, and then inviting community and faith groups to get involved. So Rotary, um, Kiwanas, um, if you have, um, if you're in a, um, a faith community and it's something that your Sunday school program would like to work on, um, getting them involved will work towards the pledge. And other ideas, become a wildlife friendly city by participating with other wildlife conservation efforts. You know, we have Sullivan Park that is this really nice space with um, this, you know, nice, nicer sized lake. We have Kordiak Park. Um, we have some wildlife in there, LaBelle Park as well. So if, if there's ways we can also look towards um, partnering with groups and being more wildlife friendly, that's a way to work towards the pledge. Um, teaching and attending upcoming educational outreach opportunities. And we just want to really say you're not on your own. Some people wrote to me and said, I'd like to help. I would have no idea what to do. So we have a lot of people here that want to help and, and um, make sure you feel supported. So here are some upcoming, this is going way faster than I thought it would, but we're going to have question and answer. So, <laughs> um, so upcoming, we have some education opportunities you can know about right now. So if you want to write these down, you can. I will email you links to all these though. But um, 
the League of Women Voters has two events coming up in the next uh, week and a half. On March 8th is a Building Pollinator Habitat. Um, so that's a free event. These are all free. And you don't have to be a member of the League of Women Voters and you don't have to be a woman either. Um, so you can sign up for that. And then um, on March 9th, the Anoka County District is, they're having a grant discussion. So there are some fundings out there for you even to do your own yard. If you wanna take over you know, a five by five space or a three by five space and you need a little funds to help you put in that garden, um, this will be a good, good place to learn about those grant opportunities. And it's meant for four people. Um, it's not meant for like some high level organization. So it's written in a way that anybody should be able to fill this grant in, and they wanna help you get it. And a couple more opportunities, um, March 18th um, through the Columbia Heights Library, um, they're having the Birdscaping Your Yard class, which I've taken a couple times. Um, Heights Nexus has um, partnered on this in the past. It's a local person who lives here in Columbia Heights and she is a birder, loves birds. And so she has taken her whole yard and made it bird friendly. So she talks about landscaping for birds and you know, birds and pollinators go hand in hand. So this is a great class for you if you wanna learn more about that. And then through the Columbia Heights Community Ed program, we are um, working with MWMO on a class called Planting for Pollinators Starting Small. Um, we, we can have so many opportunities this year and going forward because, you know, we can't plant stuff for butterflies and then not keep going forward. They're going to want to come back next year and, and lay their eggs and there'll be more butterflies. So we're starting something to keep moving this forward, right? Um, uh, the MWMO has an amazing, um, amazing campus in Northeast Minneapolis. Lots and lots of native plantings. Um, in the summer, there's lots of butterflies in there and it's just beautiful. And you can visit it right now, it's all accessible. There's no fence or gate. Um, so you can just drive over and walk through it. But as summer comes on, we probably can even um, schedule a social distance tour out there as well. So a couple opportunities for you to start learning right away before we can plant. So now you ask, what can I do to help with this Mayor's Monarch Pledge? So I just wanna re remind you, we need all skill sets and types of volunteers all ages and abilities. You have a five-year-old, they can help. You have a 105-year-old, they can help. Um, professional gardeners or newbies. And there's, a, there's a space for everyone. And we also need behind the scenes volunteers. People who are like, I wanna help butterflies, but I don't really like playing in the dirt. I don't really wanna garden, um, but I really wanna help. I'd like to walk through a park and see butterflies, but I don't really want to do the hands-on work. Uh, we, have, we have things you can do to be a part of this as well. And then we're also looking to put together a committee of leaders who want to help keep track of this information and volunteers as we go through this project. So here are just some um, sort of job descriptions I came up with to kind of get people thinking out, outside of the box. You know, my first thought on the Monarch Pledge is, okay, this means I should plant some milkweed but there's kind of more things in that and you may have more gifts that you're willing to share with us. Um, if you're an artist, we want public community art to promote what we're doing, monarch, monarchs and, and pollinators. Uh, we need someone to design signs. So I mentioned the, um, the map, map our monarchs idea. We thought it would be really great if we could have a small yard sign that you could put in your front yard, even if your monarch butterfly garden's in the back. Um, you could put it out front saying, you know, we're mapping our monarchs and you drive around town and you'd say, oh, those people are also planting for monarchs. So somebody designing that sign. Um, I have a dot, 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 insert your idea here. But if you're an artist, anything you do will help us get to that pledge. So if you can think of something, I'm interested to hear about it. Um, obviously, if you're a gardener or you want to garden, our parks need volunteers, as Connie mentioned. Your yard can have a garden. Um, if you have an HOA, we kind of get extra points. If we can get HOAs and apartment buildings, multi-unit housing, if they wanted to work on putting in a pollinator-friendly garden. 
you know, we want to look away from those dead green zones of just turf. So if you live in an apartment building and your management says, you know what, let's try it. We'll, we'll put a small garden in. Even if you don't know how to do it, we can figure out people in this group to, to make that happen. Um, and then single family homes, but this is accessible for everyone. Um, but if you can't do it at your own place, like we said, we have other gardens that you can work at. Um, and you can teach others. We can use um, Zoom to teach people about, um, you know, their eggs, how the, how the butterfly, you know, evolves through that whole thing. You can teach about gardening as well or in person. Um, if you're a writer, we need to write the proclamation. So if anyone wants to jump on that and help write the proclamation, um, they're welcome to do that. We also would be great if we had someone who helped with social media updates and kept our group knowing what's going on and lets the community know how exciting this all is. Um, we could use someone to write press releases to send to the newspapers, letters to the editor to get people more aware of how we need to take care of our monarchs. Um, and then also networking with other organizations. Um, someone mentioned Springbrook. Um, there's you know the Silverwood. There are so many different places that we can um, network and maybe partner and they may have some supplies we can use to teach people here. So if anyone is that's kind of their their skill set, we can definitely use you here. Um, if you love taking pictures and videos, you know, we want to progress, um, we want to capture our progress with photos and videos. Maybe somebody would like to put together a documentary and keep track of stuff all year long and then we can have a video at the end of all these things we did. Um, and then sharing our photos with the city website and our social media. So if that's something you want to share and you like to do that, love to have that help. Um, and as I said before, if you're an organizer, if you'd like to help join the committee to track our progress and help coordinate volunteers, um, we can definitely use you there. And then I'd say the last thing is general volunteers, people who say, I love to just show up and you point and I will just work on that. So we'll need people to help staff events. And you know, with the pandemic, these are all like being careful and making sure we have spacing and we don't have a lot of people. So I say events knowing that, that it's not like it used to be. Um, but if we were to do something like a Monarch Festival or um, help out at any other events, you know, we have a lot of um, milkweed seeds. Heights Next already has like bags and bags of milkweed seeds we've been collecting. Um, so handing out milkweed seeds to people um, at home, you could take some milkweed seeds and put them in envelopes, get them all ready, and then we can just hand them off to people. So there's lots of things that um, it'd be great to have some friendly faces ready to um, hand out info, um, that kind of stuff too. So if you're gardening at home and you're like, well, I planted my stuff, now I have nothing else to do until you know, the butterflies will come, uh, we can still use you to keep the, this going and you can plant milkweed seeds kind of you know, all the time. They, they need to have a winter um, freeze uh, process so that they, they open up to, um, to, uh, I don't know, to grow. So, but you can plant them kind of any time. So we should be handing out seeds kind of all the time as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, like petitioning to have ordinances change. So pesticides, herbicides, and other chemicals used in Columbia Heights and Minnesota, uh, what we're using isn't harmful to pollinators. So um, doing that, uh, that work will be very helpful to the butterflies. So that was a lot of information. Um, in the next few days though, after this meeting, um, I just want to let you know what's going to happen next. So um, we'll email you a survey asking how you want to be involved. Um, and then all the questions and answers that we're going to have now, we'll keep track of those. And that'll also be in the email back to you. So um, you don't have to take notes right now if you don't want to. And then all of the topics, I will have um, links to those in the email. And then, um, and then, of course, links to those upcoming classes I talked about. We'll have those in there as well. Um, and that way you can register for those. Like I said, those are all free classes. Um, I have checked in with, you know, all of those groups and they're, it's open to the public. Like I said, you don't have to be a member and you don't even have to have a library card to do the, uh, the birdscaping class. So um, anyone can do that. And then we'll also include in that email our next meeting date um, for this group. So you coming on right now is, is that you're interested. Um, I have your email. Is, 
for going forward, you will always be emailed whenever something's on. You can just email back if you want to get off the list if you don't want to. Um, but that will be mainly how we keep in, in contact. And um, you can kind of come in and go as you need to. So, um, but I really want to make sure we stay in touch. So I don't want to have this be a one and done. You came to the meeting and and then we never hear from you again. Even if you're planting your own garden, we would love to keep track of it so we can say how much Columbia Heights has. That's a friendly, um, healthy space for the butterflies. Um, and then we need to track that so we can report it to the National Wildlife Federation at the end of the year. And I just wanna say thank you guys again for being here. I know we're gonna rock this. We have so many things that we're already doing. Um, Minnetonka was just given an award for being champions for the mayor's monarch pledge. And they did 23 items. Um, and that's a lot, but the stuff that we've already listed, we are over 23 items. So <laughs> I know we're doing really well. And with this many people showing up and the excitement I've heard from all of you, people who've been emailing, they're I've, I've gotten two cards in the mail from people saying how excited they are. And there's, I think people on this call even who aren't even in Columbia Heights um, that wanna help out the monarchs and other pollinators. So there's a lot of enthusiasm here. Um, but yeah, we're just, we're just gonna rock this. This is gonna be awesome. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's basically it. Um, this screen has my contact info. You guys all got an email from me unless you came through Facebook and saw the link there. But um, you know my phone number and um, my mayor email as well. So you can contact me anytime you have a question. But um, yeah, so that's basically a lot of info and our information for you. And, um, and next we just have, if there's any questions. We do have some questions. Um, Courtney Halt had asked if all of these events are virtual, the ones that are the League of Women Voters, the birdscaping, the MWMO. Um, Thank do you, we have any more information on that? Uh, Courtney, you can, you can say more as well. Um, they are, they are all, all Zoom um, meetings. Okay, great, nothing to add. I just wanted to make sure we had the, the option to be safe about it. <laughs> That's very, yep, yeah, very smart. Yep, I should have said that right away. We also have a very similar question from both Barb Babacool and Margo Ashmore are asking about the, um, about what kinds of pesticides the city is using. Um, so Barb is asking, um, what specifically are the long-term plans for the city to reduce the amount of pesticides? And Margo has said like the city gardening staff um, have, have they changed pesticides and, and herbicides or, or should it start there? Um, Barb or Margo, do you want to say more on that? Um, I know uh, Connie may know a bit about answering that question. What Kevin um, Hansen from Public Works or Kelly, you can also jump on too. Uh, Kevin Hansen has said that they only use um, any of the sides for areas that um, are the turf areas, like for the baseball field where they want the special turf for people who are running around and they don't want it necessarily full of weeds. Um, so, but it sounds like there's a gray area of kind of like where, where they're being used when they're not. Um, and I think, um, so I don't wanna over say something and get it wrong, but uh, we can definitely get a link to that information um, and send it out to people so we can you know, move forward on how we can make that better. It would also be helpful to know what um, alternatives are and, you know, things like costs and just, you know, helping, helping them to not say no, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. Part of that too, I think is, um, is the, is some public pressure that we don't expect things to look like a lawn from the fifties. You know, we, we don't expect that everything from sidewalk to the next block over is continual gr green grass that's three inches high. You know, if we expect that there's supposed to be some native spaces where it'll look like a prairie land, which means it looks like weeds sometimes. Um, Tammy at the MWMO, when she was there, she's not there anymore, but she has had explained many times to me how um, doing specific plantings lets people know this is a garden. 
you know, it, it isn't just a, a patch that the city forgot to mow and it turned into weeds. It's a specific space um, and it's prairie plants. So I think that's it too, is, is letting people know when you see those places and appreciating it for it being a prairie, that it isn't, um, it isn't lazy. Um, so I think changing those standards of expectations will help as well. But thank you very much because money is always important. And if we can show there's a cost savings, mm -hmm. uh, that's always really good for our city's budget. Yeah. yeah. And signage would help with that too. Yes, signage, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is Barb, and I just think if the city takes a leadership role, then people really do follow what the city is doing. And so if we can, you know, just kind of promote that the city is having these areas, it's easier for some of us maybe to educate other people like, hey, the city is doing it, and we're kind of following suit with the city. Thank you. Mayor, if I could jump in for a second. Yes, um, this is Kelly, the city manager. I think part of it's a work in progress and it's certainly not something we'll, we'll be able to fully change everything over, you know, in a short period of time. But I think having Liam on staff full time that had never been a full time position before uh, last year, having him leading the, the charge on that, um, our landscaping, our gardening staff, also, I know, Mayor, you mentioned, or maybe Councilmember Biskins, that um, the Assistant Fire Chief and I actually worked on some, some yard standards, changing what we had had in the past as far as just everything has to be turf grass. And I think Councilmember Biskins mentioned um, Liam also looking at those turf grass alternatives. So it's a work in progress, but um, there certainly are initiatives at the city level, at the public works level to try and and make things more pollinator friendly in general um, and, and more native looking. It's always, it, but you're right, we have to do that in a, man, in a manner that fits the space. Um, and again, that it's a, it's a transition and it's not something we can do all in a year or two or even five. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. And I will add in that too, that, um, you know, the council, if the council doesn't hear from people, they don't know it's important. And um, sending an email to the, all of the council members and myself, um, you know, it isn't a negative, it isn't complaining. You just saying what you'd like to see in your city is great feedback. It's good for people to know, oh, this is on people's minds, or you saw this in a different city and you like what they're doing, you know, there. Um, those are all fair things to do. And that will definitely help us. And you can send it to the city manager as well, um, but it helps us know that it's important um, to you. So I think we'll, uh, blend the two of them from what Barb was saying, like the city is doing some things and we'll promote that. And then hearing from um, you, then we know we're doing the right thing and then you guys want to see more of it. We have a few more questions. If you guys are not following along in the chat, there's been a couple questions about um, uh, what specific classes you can take uh, to learn about native plantings, where you can learn these things. Uh, Renea said there's um, some classes going on at the library. Uh, Sarah Evenson has also put in some, some links as well. We're gonna capture all these at the end. So we'll send all this stuff out after the meeting as well. We do have a few other questions. Um, so Scott Van Cleve is, is asking, um, will there be an effort for inclusion around this project, uh, like efforts to include more members of the BIPOC community. Um, Shay had kind of also echoed this question as well. So Scott, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Sorry about, can you hear me okay? Yes, hi Scott, yes, yeah. thank you for being here. Hi, um, nice to see everyone. I look forward to meeting um, everyone in the future. Um, yeah, I just, uh, a quick look at the people in this group and we look um, uh, maybe a little underrepresented um, with the BIPOC, the Black Indigenous people of color. And this just seems like a great opportunity to, uh, um, to reach out to the community to make it more inclusive. And um, I'm not sure what those efforts could be, but um, it's just a great chance to do that, so. Thank you for um, bringing that up and Shay as well. Um, there's actually a couple of things. So I'm meeting with the, um, 
our Somali community and East African community in a couple of weeks. And um, I've, I've been talking with them. Um, and, uh, but one of the things I'm asking them is also like, would you like to get involved? Um, we have a couple people from the East African community that are in Heights Next. And so they've, they're already involved a little bit with some gardening. Um, one of the people has her own uh, community garden plots. And so she's very involved in gardening. So we have some people coming on, but the reason I mentioned them specifically is they are um, a really good bridge to bring in more people. Um, and you know, when you have a language barrier or a comfort level, it's, it's really nice to have people who are willing to be that bridge to community members. I'm also meeting with our native community. I've started with our um, American Indian parent advisory group at the school and reached out to them about having one of our, um, we have some city land that's kind of just a, a lot that has been mown and Public Works has let Heights Next know that if we'd like to use it for a garden, we can. So I've talked to um, our native community about making it a um, specific sanctuary with um, kind of like a dedicated dedicated signage that, um, that uh, I guess to give, to give an honoring space, because we've talked about doing a land acknowledgement um, from Columbia Heights, that we are on stolen land, that people were here before the colonists, um, people are still here that were on that land, and people that are here are enriching our community, they're here, and it's part of our future. And with this being Columbia Heights's 100 year anniversary, um, the 100 year anniversary committee has has also said yes they'd like to make a land acknowledgement in this 100 year space of um you know acknowledging that it was stolen land so there's kind of two things happening one's from the city um and then one's a special occasion with the 100 you know in, in coinciding with the 100 year anniversary but um but the people i had spoke to were really thrilled about this idea of having like a special garden space um and that's something that you know, when I've asked, when I asked them about this, I also reassured them um, that, okay, so my dad's from Mexico. So there's like a them and we and me thing. So it's kind of sometimes I have to remember how I should phrase this. Um, that when I'm asking the native community, if they'd like to help write the land acknowledgement, if they'd like to help build this garden, I also don't want to say this is something to honor you. You get to do all the work. If you don't want to build it, well, then I guess we don't have it. Like that's not really the way we should do it. And I and I feel like what you're kind of asking too, Scott, is if there's ways we can all make sure that we're not leaving parts of our community vacant, um, that we need to do that part to go in and help those areas as well, so that everyone can enjoy these spaces and enjoy the butterflies. And kind of like I said, we don't want a dead zone. You don't want to say like, well, that that neighborhood, you know, the people there just didn't want to do a, a garden. You know, that if people want a garden, but they don't have the time or expertise to put into it, I think we're going to have enough volunteers here to make sure it happens. So um, my friend Bisharo, who gardens, and she's Somali, the whole weight of of um, gardening shouldn't fall to her shoulders because she is, you know, one one person who I know gardens and is Somali American. So we want to make sure we're supporting each other, that people are being allies for our under underserved communities and working in partnership. Um, and right now it looks like that's definitely where we're going. So I appreciate you asking and then understanding to the, um, the level of like stepping up to help people that, that were not being helped before. We want to make sure that we have that, that equity um, an inclusion there. So thank you, Scott and Shay, for, for bringing those topics up. Good. I want to jump in too. I forgot to mention with the, the Blooming Sunshine Garden in Lomiaki, Kat Audet Lupke has been doing very uh, a search. We want to make it a multicultural garden with plants from all over the world that can grow in that space. And she's connected with the Korean restaurant here at Hilltop. We've had, um, she's planted already plants from other countries that will grow in our garden. Um, we also up in the community garden have a group of gardeners, quite a few of them from Kenya that grow a really interesting plant that they harvest several times over the summer. So um, anything we can do to pull in people to make it a multicultural event and uh, process 
um, we are looking for ideas and also at in working on the things we have been doing. So, because um, we want people, everyone to be feel welcome and feel involved in this uh, project. Mm -hmm. and, and teach and t be able to teach them too, if they're, if they're willing and excited to do it, um, but haven't grown up in that experience or they are, they're from another country where things were just different. You know, we wanna make sure we're, we're bridging that gap. Um, and, and one of the things I'll mention too for the um, Blooming Sunshine Food Forest is we have been working on a lot of signage that doesn't have words, that has pictures. So people don't, you know, aren't looking for language. They can see when something's right because of the photo and, um, and understand how to, how to belong and how to be a part of picking and harvesting food without having to read English. Um, so we really wanna take those barriers down. We have a few more questions from the chat. Uh, Lori Edlin is asking, are you going to put together a presentation that can be given to HOA boards to go over like these benefits and so on, um, especially those that are kind of resistant to, to boards um, to show that, that, we, that we do work with volunteers at no cost to the HOA and so on. Um, Lori, do you wanna say a little bit more about that? And you don't have to if you don't want to, Lori. <laughs> yeah, not not really. Um, you know, we our board currently is not really receptive to some of this stuff. But if we could show the benefits, and that uh, you know they would really just have to kind of approve it, and we could get other people to kind of pitch in and do the work. But a, like a presentation deck or something along those lines would be, I think, quite helpful. And I know we're we're not the only HOA in Columbia Heights, so. Um, I think that would be great. I think, um, you know, definitely these slides that I've created can be shared. Um, I'll, I'll, this whole slide deck will get shared with you too. So if there was something you saw and you're like, what was that again? That'll get shared with you. Um, but I would be very interested in working with a couple people who are part of an HOA to see what we should brainstorm and come up with to help um, get those, those groups on our side towards helping the monarchs. And, and your HOA and residents that you're, you know, your neighbors. Thank you. Changing gears a little bit. Uh, Kathy Kerval had a question about, um, about planting shaggy native plants. Is there an ordinance that's preventing from residents from planting those types of plants in their front yards? Um, I can, uh, I think Kelly can jump in too if she wants. Uh, we had a uh, ordinance about what can be put in lawns and, and uh, quote a native planting that uh, one of our residents um, encountered this summer with her yard and it was quite restrictive and quite old fashioned and that's what uh, initiated the changes that Liam Genter and Dan O'Brien are working on to make our new ordinance which hasn't been completed yet but they are working on it to make it more user friendly more realistic and uh, cost a, you know something that's not super strict but that people can use as guidelines for their yard and we're hoping Kelly I'm not sure when we plan on having that come before the council for approval but um, we are working on that because we definitely want to encourage people to have wonderful pollinator friendly yards um, grass turf as pretty as it is is uh, does not invite um, wildlife pollinators and I think people definitely need the flexibility to turn their yards front or back. I have a front yard that's kind of like a jungle and my both my neighbors are love their turf, um, but they have learned more and put in more plants in their yard, have lowered their uh, use of pesticides, herbicides, and, and fungicides in their yard just because of my yard being here. So um, it's also a great educational tool to use for your neighborhoods. So um, that's hopefully we'll have an update on that soon. Thank you. Thank you. Got a question from Andy Newton, um, kind of asking about the use of uh, the harmful chemicals by residents. Uh, is there a chance that we could um, eventually as a city place some kind of restrictions on residential use of harmful chemicals? Um, or possibly would a citizen's petition be helpful in this area? Um, Andy, you can unmute and say more about this if you need to. Um, hi. Um, no, that pretty much covers it. I, uh, I know that's probably not always popular with folks to the idea of um, 
putting more restrictions on folks coming from the a government standpoint, but <clears throat> but the fact is that um, harmful chemicals in one yard have, um, affect the wildlife in all the surrounding yards and um, can have a pretty negative negative impact on all our pollinators. So um, it wouldn't be a, a bad idea for us as a city to start looking into um, if there's chemicals out there that folks are using that maybe we should um, encourage at least or restrict at, at worst. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that pretty much covers it. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, I know that there's uh, communities out there across the country that have been working on this issue. I'm connected to one one group in California that's been doing a ton of work on it. Um, and I know that that in this city, there still might be some pushback on, you know, controlling what you can or can use. But just for people's um, information, uh, residential properties have more um, chemicals poured on them than farmers. Farmers are regulated and have to measure everything that they use out in their crops. And even though they're trying to still work on it, it'd be great if we could find an initiative by a group of folks here in town that could do the research. Um, we could start out with education educating the community, offering them alternatives that are cost effective. Um, and so if there's a group there here in this group here that would like to start doing the research and bringing it, I definitely think that's something to consider. And if we could do it in such a way that uh, the pushback would be less once that people are educated as to why this is important, it's also important for their health. There's a lot of chemicals in those uh, sprays that they use that not only hurt uh, pollinators, but they also can hurt themselves. So um, if there's people in this group that could jump in and, and I know it would consider some research and how you'd present it to the council or to the city, I definitely think that's a, an issue that could easily be addressed in the city. Mm -hmm. These and these all I'll mention too that all of the questions people are asking, we will be adding these to our survey. So if someone, you know, you may not have thought of this earlier, but now hearing Andy's thing, you're like, I'm interested. You'll just check off that box, you're interested. And then as we start curating lists, lists of people who are interested, you know, we'll be sending that email off to those people to see if you can work together to come up with something or if you have research and that's kind of what Connie's saying, then as that will get momentum, um, you know, this is very much a community thing. And yes, yes, I'm the mayor, um, Connie's a council member and we have our city manager on this call. But um, this is a community thing. This is this is nothing that the three of us can make happen. You know, we have to do this together. I live here in Columbia Heights, just like you. Um, this is something that's important to me. But I'm still only one individual, kind of at the end of the day. I'm the mayor, but I'm still one person. And so, we really need to work together and support each other in this. Um, I do have the be friend be friendly lawn sign. People may have seen those. Um, there's an organization. It's I think. $10 for the sign. But the, the great thing about the sign is you're telling people you have a bee friendly lawn and you're not putting chemicals there. But it's a great way to converse with your neighbors. And not everyone's gonna change what they're doing, but it does help educate them, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. And all those little things help, um, help us move towards a, a healthier, safer place. Um, Frost, do you have any, any more questions? There have been a few other questions that have come and gone, and, and it sounds like Sarah Evans has actually been answering the majority of them in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, Sorry, I, I'm a landscape architect, so I have a lot of resources that, you know, I use day to day, and um, they're really, you know, user friendly, so might as well get them out there for other people to take a peek at. Thanks for doing that. Are there some questions, though, that you want to ask the group in case people aren't looking at the chat and may not um, be aware of these questions and or answers, I guess? There's nothing else specific in the chat, um, but yeah, Sarah, if you want to speak some more on your resources. <laughs> sure. um, well, and I'll just add, I mean, there's a huge range of ways you can get involved with supporting pollinators. They don't, not, it doesn't always have to be like really shaggy, tall native plants. Um, and for people who are wondering about HOAs, um, one of the easy ways to get involved is by, um, you can do overseeding of a traditional lawn with a pollinator friendly flowering lawn, which just has um, clover and a couple of other flowering species and is typically mowed um, a little bit less frequently and a little bit higher. So it looks pretty much the same as a standard lawn, but it just provides um, flowering species 
throughout the season um, to help support a variety of pollinators. So that's a really easy, almost like, you know, same appearance way to um, help support pollinators. And then you can go all the way towards um, converting portions of your lawn to prairie. So, and then with that, there's um, the idea of cues to care, which are um, just nods to neatness and um, showing people who might not know what's going on with your yard that it is um, a well-managed intentional place. So things like signage can really help. We talked about that. Um, also having a mown border around um, your taller plants um, or doing some fencing um, just to kind of um, prop up some of the plants from flopping over. So there's a, a lot of ways we can make our native plantings um, look a little bit less wild and more managed for people um, to kind of bring them along on the journey with us and um, get them, you know, thinking about native plantings in a different way. Thank you, Sarah. Um... Very, very good, good insight there. Um, for people, so I know we can always, you know, Google and go to YouTube and look up a lot of things, um, you know, like how do I start a pollinator garden? But, but besides you doing that, this group though, I will be making sure that we are also sending you an email saying our group is having our own class. Um, so I have master gardeners who have already volunteered. Um, Sarah's volunteered to teach about, um, about plants you can use in your landscaping. So we have a few people already who have said they wanna help teach something. So you will get an email saying, you know, do you wanna learn how to take like a five by five foot space in your yard to make it pollinator friendly? What do you need? You know, what's the good basic way to start? So we will do a couple of things like that to get you started and you don't have to on your own decide how to go forward with it. We just don't have dates for those yet, but that's will happen. We allowed to ask questions. Sure. Um, I, and I think that's really cool. So I just moved into my house at the end of last year and I, through COVID have never met any, like I've met my neighbors on either side really sporadically. I've never met the people that live on my block. Um, and I, I think something like this could be a really cool challenge. Like as far as I can tell, we, I don't have any sidewalks on my block. Like we don't necessarily have that kind of like boulevard space to really play around with, but I think it would be really cool just as a way to sit, introduce myself and and meet everybody, but also say like, hey, the city's got this really cool thing going on um, to try to support pollinators and specifically monarchs. And I think it would be really cool if we could be a, a block that does this really well and we were kind of dedicated to change. Like, I think that could be really cool, but I'm only one person and because of COVID, like the, it's just harder to talk to people or like actually share that kind of information. So the things that you're just talking about, I guess I'm, my question is, is can we make that so it's a resource that if, you know, someone across the street and, and five doors down is interested in this, that they don't have to join into this. Like it's harder for me to convince someone to sign on to the whole thing rather than just say like, hey, there's going to be this free um, kind of tutorial that going on for an hour, um, you know, the library or the, the city's putting it on or whatever. So exactly what you're talking about of what's going on in the group, like, can we make some of those just available as resources that, you know, we can friend of a friend it to someone? Sure thing. Yep. So we will, um, so the plan will be that everyone in this group will get those things emailed to them. Um, and of course you can share them, but then we also will put it in the newspaper and we will put these things in the city newsletter. Um, which comes out quarterly. So there'll be information in there about what's coming up. Um, but I think one of the ideas, which would be really cool from what you were just saying is, what if we created like a little postcard that maybe, you know, you could go out and like drop off at all your, you know, neighbor's houses and it just says, I'm joining in this thing. One of the ideas in the, in the Monarch Pledge um, is do like a neighborhood challenge and see like if you can have the neighborhood that does the most things. Um, so that's kind of one of the ideas, but you know, you could definitely do that kind of like what Sarah was saying, you know, if you take a postcard and say, I am turning over part of my yard, so you may see some longer grasses and, and we as an organization can come up with this wording so it doesn't fall on you to have to try to explain it to everybody. Um, and of course, when I say we, I'm asking for people who want to volunteer, people who are writers or maybe who already know about this sort of resource. Um, but that's something we could do with the city, we could, um, you know, have, I'm sure we can have those printed up. We have volunteer groups will help pay for this. So it doesn't have to come out of a city budget if we don't have room for that. Um, and then people could come down into the city hall and pick them up and, you know, get 50 postcards to take to their neighbors or whatever. 
Um, but that's a great way to invite people and give them some information. And um, and we'll have the information on the city website too for these for these kind of tutorial um, classes as well. And this is a great time to do that because gardening is sounds like it's going to be a huge hit again this summer because of COVID. I know with ordering my own seeds, two of the companies I use had to put a, a hold on taking more orders for like two weeks so they could catch up. So um, I think that would be a great idea for neighborhoods if you wanted to go around and talk to your neighbors. I think this would be a good year because a lot of people are interested in improving their yards and gardening and things like this. And uh, that'd be terrific. terrific. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Can I jump in on something? Um, so I just wanted to offer some thoughts have been brought up about HOAs and people starting gardens there. I was from past experience, I was going to offer the city and volunteers just some couple of insights. Sometimes the HOAs have some people who really want to do that. And then even when they're well intentioned and get a plan going, what I've seen happen is Nobody really knows how to A, make the plan for it to happen. And there are resources out there besides private landscape architectures who are architects who are wonderful, but Anoka Conservation District and possibly the NWMO could help some with that. But there's also a need to coordinate services between people who are trying to establish those grasses or trying to get those plants going. Um, in the past, I know one HOA struggled to have good communication going between their vendors. So even though they did a really noble effort to try to get something going, it failed because of a communication issue. So I was just gonna offer that as people try to reach out and help there, that that's a point to really consider so that you can have success and maybe even start small to get used to things before you go jump into something big that maybe you don't have coordination quite lined up for. So just throwing that out there. Another yeah. I just wanted to say it should be noted too that if you are doing more of a prairie planting, um, you know, it typically takes around three years for those species to get established. And so you really are making a commitment for about three years to have some pretty intensive maintenance um, because those plantings are billed as low maintenance and they are once they're established, but that establishment period um, can be pretty intensive and uh, it really helps to know what you're doing. And so for an HOA or for someone who's just um, wants to do it but is a little bit um, less adept at, at that type of gardening, um, hiring someone to help you get it established for three years is really great. You can learn a lot along the way and then um, the maintenance after that is, is a lot easier. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And Those getting... are really good points, Sarah. I was going to also let people know that Anoka Conservation District in the past has been very supportive to trying to provide grants to HOAs to get these kinds of plantings going, so. Um, another, uh, getting back to Rachel's question, um, if you can, another great resource in your neighborhood that knows people um, pretty well is your uh, neighborhood watch leader. If you have someone, I know we have about 120 different neighborhood watch uh, groups in our city. And that's somebody you could connect with that would know that know the neighbors um, have been around and could connect you to other gardeners in your, in your street. Um, is another way of connection and also something they can promote and talk about too later on with the neighborhood watch stuff during the summer. Thank you, Connie. We can actually, um, I could uh, reach out to the neighborhood watch group so that they can take that information and put it out to their neighbors that this is starting in case people hadn't don't know about the Monarch Pledge. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. I know that they usually email out once, once a month. So we could, uh, if you would, get in contact with them, we could possibly make a challenge through the neighborhood watch groups too. Mm. <laughs> and the ones that don't have neighborhood watch could still participate and just join in, but that's another way of initiating that. That'd be an awesome thing in August or September, whenever we have the neighborhood watch night, hopefully we can have it this year um, mm -hmm. to uh, see what groups did the, the most work it would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Very fun. There's just a couple more questions in the chat. Um, most of these things we're already kind of covering with everybody that's been speaking. But um, uh, one, one question from Barb Kondrick was, does the city use flowering plants like clover in any of their turf areas? I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that one. I don't know the answer to that. Um, if the city has been trialing um, different pollinator friendly um, turf mixes, it will likely have clover in it. Um, so I'm excited to hear about how Liam's experiments are going and um, if we can get 
that um, used on a broader scale across the city, because I think that can have a really big impact if it's something that the city adopts. Um, and that's um, those pollinator friendly bee lawns are something that um, the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board um, are incorporating more and more um, across the city of Minneapolis. So we already have like a, a pretty big range of habitat that's going to be generated out of that in the coming years. Um, and because we're in such close proximity, I think um, it makes a lot of sense. I think we could ask Liam too if he could yeah. give us the list give us the list of the plants that he is uh, experimenting with and also pictures so folks can see what type of flowering and maybe even look for that around the city. We could do a little hunt. <laughs> yeah, I will ask Liam um, when, when we have some more information, we can send that to everybody as well. Maybe he can even do a little video. He does, um, our city's doing some really good videos lately. So that might be a fun thing. And yeah, let us know where they're being so we could go walk over and check it out when the snow's gone. You know, the lawn between all the, the chain of the Lions Gardens and then the big one we're working on, that would be an awesome, nice, very distinct area to try to work on that. Mm -hmm. Anything else for us in the chat? Otherwise, if, like uh, you can also just unmute and, and, and ask a question as well if you don't want to deal with putting it in the chat. Nothing for us? Not a lot left. Um, there's there's certainly a lot of uh, excitement about spreading this information to the rest of the community and, and inviting people to join. One idea that came up was creating a, a Facebook uh, Columbia Heights pollinator group. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's something that we could easily get done. Um, Lisa's been kicking around quite a few ideas in the chat uh, about education with kids, hands-on projects, um, maybe a little free seed library. So Lisa, would you like to say a little bit more about this? Sorry about that, I had to find the mute there on the iPad. Um, yeah, um, with the Master Gardener, I've done a lot of the projects with the kids and it's anywhere from like taking water bottles and turning them into um, self-watering planters um, or also one that they have a blast with is like, how do you eat like a bird, like the different bird tools or how to eat like an insect, just things to get them interested and kind of over that fear of nature. Um, with the kids, I, there seems to be a fear with the kids a lot about bees. And I, that would be a great project if we can kind of get them to realize that, hey, bees are our friends. They don't necessarily come after you. you know, they usually are defending themselves on that. But I think the more hands-on and more things that they can touch and such, the more interested and engaged they get on that. Um, even just things that they can take. Um, a lot of times when I did the kid projects, I would have like a little craft or something related to what we talked about that they could take home. Then they can get their parents tied into it as well too. Love it, love it. Um, thank you, thank you, Lisa. Definitely, um, I would say from anyone in this group who is interested in, um, you know, teaching something and they know that they, they know kind of in their own kind of what Lisa was saying, like, I know I can do this, but you would like some support. Um, you know, that'll be something we'll want you to put in that survey to let us know. And then we'll just get it. You, you kind of schedule it when you want to. And I think we can get people there. You know, if you want to do it through zoom, if you want to do it at a park pavilion where, you know, people are spread out, um, we can, you know, we can figure those logistics out. Um, but you know, I'm sure families can do this. Um, Renee from um, the library, if you're still here, um, we have talked about with Heights Next doing like a seed library. Um, it's it's come up a couple times, and it's nothing that we can probably necessarily totally make it happen for sure and figure all the logistics out of it. But there are other places that have seed libraries. But I don't know if Renee, if that's anything you want to comment on or at all or how you would like to share anything with us? We can certainly look into starting that. Okay. We've not done that in the past, but I know some people who have started it, I can reach out to them and get some more information. And we are certainly a community gathering space, so we can provide a space for that to happen. Fantastic, fantastic. And the library, if you haven't been there, the um, the grounds of the library is, is all um, rain garden, native that has permeable parking and uh, driveways and there's lots of signage there learning about ways that that space was specifically set up to um, help the water um, 
help the water table and clean water as things are draining. And there's a lot of a lot of um, knowledge in, in that space as well. So thank you, Renee. That would be, I have like literally bags and bags of Heights Next Seeds <laughs> that I need to share. <laughs> we have lots of donations and we've, we've started harvesting seeds. So um, we have lots, lots to plant, lots to give away. Well, I just think this is so exciting. Um, we're hoping to have an art festival in Columbia Heights. I think it'd be really cool if at the art festival, we could do some monarch, um, you know, we, we could do monarch uh, chalk drawings as an art thing would be really fun to, um, you know, incorporate a little monarch stuff as we go throughout the year. Uh, like I said, the movie night, um, I've talked to um, um, staff at Mersion Hall about, um, there's a, a, a documentary called Flight of the Monarchs um, and they're willing to show it there. Um, you know, it'd be easiest if we could show it inside if we wanted to social distance, but we also could rent a screen and do it outside as well. Um, people could bring their own picnic and sit on their own blankets so we're distanced from others. But there are just uh, so many exciting ideas. Um, you know, we can, we can kind of make this whatever we want to do and you can do things individually and then just sort of email the group or email maybe your team. We'll kind of see how this is gonna work together. And, um, and you can do stuff with others. So there's um, you know, ways I think everyone can be comfortable and keep the momentum going. Well, we're, we have about 10 minutes left. So if there's anything else though, people, if, even if you just wanna share like something you're super excited about maybe, or something that you've learned today that you didn't know about or you didn't know would be an opportunity um, if you would like to unmute, um, you could just kind of unmute and just add that in. Um, I think we'd all love to hear people's exciting stories or comments. I was wondering if people are familiar with the Monarch Festival that Nokomis East Neighborhood Association had sponsored. No, I, I haven't heard of that. I, I don't know if they're still doing it, but I'll try and look that up and send it to you if I find it. Thank I've, you. I've heard about it, but I haven't wasn't able to attend that year when they had it. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody that we don't need to reinvent the wheel on a lot of this. Like if you see someone who's already done some really cool stuff, like reach out to them, ask them how they did it. Most of the time people are more than happy to talk about the trials that they already went through and how they mitigated a lot of those. And then we'll just straight up steal their ideas and like repackage them here and and do that. But a lot of people are already doing really, really cool things. And we have an opportunity to just like broaden the impact of that. So I don't know why we would we wouldn't try to take advantage. So like go forth and, and just steal. Exactly. Exactly. So Barb and I know there's a bunch of Facebook groups out there. I know someone talked about creating one here, but the pollinator friendly yards is a good one that I'm um, a member of, I know Amatha, you are too. It just, they have signage, like um, Rachel was saying, they already have the signage, it's already done and you just need to download it. So just always use those as a resource. And those are just inspiring anyway, just to see what other people are doing. So just wanted to throw that out there too. What group is that? It would be the Pollinator Friendly Yards. It's on Facebook. And like I say, they already have the signs done. So you, that's what we did here is I just downloaded them and laminated them and put them on sticks. And it seemed to help a lot of people educate. It's a lot of about that is that, so. Thank you, Barb, fantastic. Yeah, we definitely don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, you know, we, we are seeing this. And like I said, there's people who were, have been writing me who don't live at Columbia Heights and are already doing this. So I'm gonna keep bringing them in and they, they wanna help because monarch butterflies, they don't just go like to one town, you know? They kind of do this thing where they travel across thousands of miles. So, so we need to work with our communities, not just Columbia Heights, but all of our neighbors wanna help each other. So we definitely can work together with more people. And even encouraging people that it's just maybe just even a few plants and such, it's really neat. Our neighbors put in what's literally called a prairie in a box. And it's just a small little square in their front yard. But even just doing some natives and those type of plants, even in containers would, would be a start. Mm -hmm. 
I would just piggyback on that. So yeah, containers work too for um, people in apartments who want to join in. Um, they might not be able to do as plants with deep as roots, but at least they can help. And also St. Anthony Village has really been working on pollinator pathways the last two or three years. So when you start talking about um, neighboring communities, we're close enough to, some of us are close enough to that. We could really help the butterflies and bees by joining forces in that regard. Anyone else, anyone learned something today or um, that you uh, that you hadn't, you know, you hadn't heard before or you're thinking like that's super exciting that that's a great possibility that you'd like to to join in on or I mean, of course, I know we all want the pandemic gone so we can just like garden together and hang out and have like a tea party or have a beer or something like that. But um, until we can have that freedom. It looks like we have a lot of ideas here and a lot of ways we can uh, can be in community to get, you know, working with our neighbors, competing against other neighbors, maybe. I love um, the idea of the food forest and even how that could be maybe turned into an event later that you get your neighbors in and you cook different things out of that garden and such as well, too. I think it would be a great way to bring people together. Mm -hmm. I, I want to say um, thank you, Amala and Connie for doing this, it's wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. I'm so glad you could join us. I love all the art on your wall behind you. I'm, uh, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> You're welcome, Kathy. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else to add, um, again, so positively thrilled. Um, I had 77 people register for this event. And when I say register, I mean, they had to email me. Not, they didn't just like something on Facebook. Like they actually had to email, go to a website, <laughs> click on it and email me to, to um, get on the link. And then, and then we did post the link on Facebook for people who didn't do that. Cause of course we still want them here as well. It was in the newspaper, people saw it there as well. Um, people posted on Nextdoor. And um, so however you got here, just so thankful that you're excited about this. You wanna work with the community and um, help the monarchs and, and other pollinators and make just a, a, a healthier community um, for, for us too, you know, us and, our, and the kids and our pets that are walking around. Um, but just really thank you for taking the time out of your day on a beautiful Saturday and, um, and we'll be sending you an email with information and, and there's gonna be a lot of information. I, since starting this, I have been given so many links to so many things about monarchs and pollinators. Um, though there will be some information, but we might actually need to just start a, a page where we just post all the links so I don't have to email them out to everybody. But, um, but as we have organizational ideas, you know, let me know. And um, like I said too, in the survey, you know, there'll be a questionnaire about what parts are you mostly interested in? And then we're going to start, people will start kind of going into their interest in this one or this one. 